Oh, hello. So, um, previous video, uh, uh, we uh, looked at some ocean chemistry, so the effects of carbon dioxide uh, on the ocean uh, uh, and its ability to sequester uh, kind of carbon out of uh, the atmosphere into the ocean and its effect on kind of acidification. So we're going to have a little bit of a look at uh, the structure of the ocean and uh, some of the, the processes that, that maybe transport uh, chemicals uh, across um, different layers within the ocean and introduce the concept that the ocean has layers. So let's, uh, let's crack on. So here uh, we've got um, uh, some data uh, from, uh, I guess, a compilation of oceanographic expeditions. Uh, and what we're looking at is uh, on the left, this is a map of the Pacific, uh, sea surface temperature. Um, so if we just focus on that for the, for the moment, um, I guess you can see that it's warmer kind of in the tropical uh, regions than, than in the poles. Uh, and that's that's largely because uh, the, the Earth receives kind of more radiation per kind of like square meter of surface uh, at the, the equator because the Earth is round uh, and uh, Polar regions, the kind of the surface is kind of like basically angled away from the sun. Uh, so, uh, or not, not away, but kind of less towards the sun. So the, the radiation is like spread out. Um, so this this leads to kind of um, uh, an imbalance between kind of the, the, the tropics, which get, get heated quite a lot um, from uh, direct heating from the sun, but, but also heating uh, from the atmosphere, radiates heat back down to the, the, the surface, um, which leads to some warm water uh, at the surface of the ocean in the in the in the in the, in the, kind of the tropics. Uh, in the in the in the polar regions, uh, the uh, the water is a lot colder because the atmosphere is a lot colder. Um, uh, so we have this kind of pole to kind of equator temperature gradient. Um, uh, and now let's have a look at what that means in terms of the depth structure of the ocean. So if we go over to the, the, the right hand side, um, so that the effect of, of having cold water in the polar regions means that that water at the surface in the polar regions, so in kind of, uh, uh, where's my little mouse pointer, in these kind of regions here. So this is a, what we're looking at is this black line, slice, vertical slice for the ocean from, this is Antarctica in the south, and I guess Alaska up in the north up here. Um, uh, and you can see that the, the ocean floor goes kind of up and down. The ocean is quite deep in the Pacific um, for a variety of reasons. Um, but if we have a look at the, the, what's happening in the, in the Southern Ocean, that this water in the Southern Ocean is particularly cold, um, in many cases below zero degrees Celsius. And because the water is cold, it becomes more dense. Okay, so warmer water is less dense uh, than colder water because the warmer water kind of expands through thermal expansion. So what this means is that in these polar regions, uh, this cold water can sink downwards. And actually it can sink downwards and because it's denser than the water that, that basically has been existing at, at lower latitudes, uh, it can fill up the ocean basins. So the deep ocean is largely uh, filled up by the sinking of cold water that forms in, in, in um, high latitude regions. Now they, these, these, these formation, these sinking regions are, are currently uh, around Antarctica. There are some in the North Atlantic as well. Uh, and you also get subduction of, of, of water from the surface in some other areas. It doesn't quite get to the bottom everywhere. But for the, for the large part, the water that does sink sinks because it is cold. And that leads to uh, the, the deep ocean being filled up with cold water, whereas the surface ocean, uh, 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 that's receiving kind of solar energy from the sun and also from the atmosphere. Um, so that's warmed up. So that means it's expanding, uh, it's less dense. So it basically floats on top of uh, the deeper, denser, colder water um, below. So we're going to have a look at uh, this in a little bit more detail off uh, the Great Barrier Reef. So this is, um, uh, I'm going to say this, these, because data are of course
Wales, plural, um, are some data from uh, the Great Barrier Reef, um, just where that menu popped up. Here you go, that's, that's where the, this red dot is where this, this, these data are. And what we're looking at in these graphs are some uh, depth profiles. We've got the surface uh, at zero and then increasing depth down the water column uh, down to 200 meters in this case. Uh, on the on the y-axis. Um, so uh, the, we've got uh, temperature, salinity, um, density uh, on the third uh, plot. So the density of seawater is uh, is dependent pretty much only on the temperature and the salinity. So warmer water is less dense um, than colder water, which is more dense, and salty water is more dense than uh, fresh water. Um, so uh, these two properties, temperature and salinity, combine to give us this neutral density profile. Um, and you can see that in the surface ocean, I guess the first thing to point out is in the surface ocean, in all of these profiles, the, the, the parameters, so the, 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 the temperature here, uh, I guess I can draw a little dotted line across here. So above this dotted line, the parameters are quite constant. So temperature is at a constant value, salinity is a constant value, and because temperature and salinity are at a constant value, so is density. Now, the, uh, the reason for that is that in the surface ocean, uh, the surface ocean is in contact with the atmosphere, the atmosphere moves around, winds blowing, all that kind of stuff, and that causes there to be some waves. Uh, and what those waves do is they basically, they mix up this surface layer uh, of water. Uh, and what that does is that homogenizes all of the, the, the physical properties. Um, so it's basically well mixed. So we call this sometimes this layer at the top of the ocean, the mixed layer, um, uh, because it is well mixed. Now, below that mixed layer, we have the colder water. Um, sometimes it's more salty, sometimes it's less salty. The saltiness is uh, a balance between kind of when that water was at the surface, evaporation and precipitation uh, into that water, and or any fresh water inputs from, from the land in terms of rivers or submarine groundwater discharge. Um, but we can have, a, if, we, if we look at the, 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 the density profile, we can see in this region, it's largely mirroring the temperature profile. So we've got this low, density water at the surface, which is largely due to it being warmer. Um, so we, we have denser water, uh, I guess we have yeah, denser water underneath less dense water. It has to be that way around. If it was the other way around, they would kind of, that would be abhorrent to nature. So they would flip the other way up uh, because you can't have uh, a heavy thing on top of a light thing. The lighter thing will always float to the top. Um, now, if we have a look at actually this, this, this faint line on this third plot, this is actually the gradient of uh, the density. And we can see that there are two peaks here, and these peaks coincide with where the, the density is increasing most rapidly with depth. Um, uh, so what these are called uh, in some kinds, of, so this is some kind called the Pickner line, okay, which is basically denoting the, the, the base of the low density layer, Pickner being density, um, at, at, of this, this, um, this low density layer of the surface. You might have heard it being called the thermocline, uh, because in, in quite a lot of situations in, in oceanography, the Pickner line is determined by the temperature variations. Now, why this is relevant is that. If you wanted to transport, transport kind of packets of water, maybe from the surface down to depth, or bring a packet of water from depth up to the surface, you have to bring it across this, this zone of, of, of high contrast in density. And to do that, you have to do work. Okay, you have to, if you wanted to move a, a basically a dense, heavy object up to the lower density layer, you're effectively lifting something up. Okay? You're not lifting the whole mass of water, you're just lifting the mass equivalent to the density differences of water. So what this means is that actually things that are in 
So chemicals, heat that are in the deep ocean, they're quite hard to mix up to the surface ocean. And likewise, it's hard to mix things that are maybe in contact with the surface ocean. They're quite hard to mix down into the deep ocean. So this, this uh, layering in the ocean acts as a, almost like a physical barrier, although it is just a fluid, so you could quite easily kind of swim through it. Uh, it acts as a physical barrier between uh, the transport of, of mixing of, of physical properties and mixing of chemicals between the surface and the deep oceans. Uh, and we can see this um, in the last plot over on, on, the, on the right hand side. This is a plot of oxygen. And we may have a close look at this um, in, 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 a, in a bit. But uh, we, we've got a high oxygen at the, at the very surface, uh, kind of here. And this is because there's an exchange of dissolved oxygen between the atmosphere and the ocean. Um, then we have an actually uh, an even higher concentration of oxygen uh, just below the surface. And this is likely because uh, likely due to photosynthesizing organisms producing oxygen. Uh, but this high oxygen in the surface layer, if I just carry on this thing across here, that can't get down into the layer of water immediately below. We have this very low oxygen concentration. Well, in this case, it's not that low, the scale doesn't go to zero. But in some regions of the ocean, we have quite dramatically low oxygen concentrations. So across this thermocline or this picnocline, we can have quite large gradients in particularly in chemical properties. And we'll have a look at that uh, in, in the next couple of uh, slides. So just to summarize uh, so far, so the ocean is layered. Uh, so it has a, a surface layer that's kind of well mixed within that layer. Um, uh, it's buoyant, it floats across the, the that deep ocean uh, and it's hard to mix material chemicals, dissolved constituents, between the mixed layer and the deep ocean. So let's have a look at uh, one of the ways in which we can actually transport stuff across this, this, this barrier, uh, other than just kind of brute force physical mixing. Um, so uh, there's this uh, example that we're going to use called the, the biological pump. So um, some of you may be familiar with this already, there are some videos which I might kind of link to uh, that, that explain it in nice kind of cartoon form. Um, but just go through some of the processes. Quite quickly. So, um, uh, some of you may be familiar with the process of photosynthesis, and this, there's this summary kind of reaction at the top here where we, where we take CO2 and water and we produce oxygen and basically some kind of um, basically biological energy. Um, now, this summary reaction at the top is not the actual reactions of photosynthesis. So if you're, uh, I guess, a biologist, biochemist, uh, you might be familiar with these reactions at the bottom here. Um, the details of these don't really matter um, for our purposes. They absolutely matter if you're dependent on photosynthesis, like all organisms, well, not all organisms, but most organisms on Earth are dependent in some way on photosynthesis. Um, but the processes are basically we take water, well, we don't, we don't photosynthesis, but water uh, is split apart by light energy uh, into basically oxygen and, uh, and hydrogen ions. And then those hydrogen ions are used by uh, uh, other processes within uh, the organism to uh, take CO2 and form your sugar. Okay? And then these other kind of molecules in here are involved. Now again the details of these molecules don't matter but the reason I'm, I'm showing them up here right now is that just to have a look at their bulk chemistry. So these are basically adenosine, diphosphate and triphosphate and these are uh, really important in the transport and transformation of energy within cells. So super important biochemical molecules um, but the reason I'm showing them is because I want you to have a look at what they're actually made of. So uh, the black um, kind of atoms in these molecules are carbon. So you might be familiar with, you know, carbon-based life forms and all that kind of stuff. But they're also, these particular molecules also have other elements. In them. They have lots of uh, phosphorus. Uh, so the orange uh, molecules, or the orange atoms in these molecules are phosphorus. And they also have uh, nitrogen. So the, the blue and nitrogen. And actually, 
quite a lot of molecules, most molecules within um, uh, the cells have these two elements within them. So all of our cell walls are phospholipids. So lots of phosphorus. Um, amino acids have a lot of you know, nitrogen. In them. So uh, so nitrogen and phosphorus are quite important also in these processes. So we can kind of include these other um, kind of elements in our summary of photosynthesis. So that simplified kind of CO2 plus water goes to oxygen and sugar. Um, we can actually kind of bring in some other important elements of this panel, which become important in terms of our uh, understanding of what might be limiting some of these processes in parts of the ocean. So now we have a process of photosynthesis that not only requires CO2, and it requires lots of CO2, um, but it also needs nitrate and phosphate uh, and the sun's energy to produce some kind of organic matter that includes kind of organic carbon, organic nitrogen and organic phosphorus. Um, so we can now see that like photosynthesis doesn't just need light, it also needs nutrient elements. And likewise, decomposition, uh, if we take organic matter and that decays, it's respired by bacteria or kind of organisms eating that organic matter. That organic matter that also contains these nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, when, it's, when it's respired, it will release CO2 into the water. Okay, it will use up oxygen out of the water, but it will also release these nutrients back into the ocean or back into the dissolved phase. So let's have a look at the impact of this on the so where do these processes happen? Well, photosynthesis happens in the surface layer of the ocean. So a variety of organisms do photosynthesize, mostly kind of algae. Um, and um, that process of photosynthesis uses up CO2 and uses up nutrients. So if there are any nutrients available in the surface ocean, um, they will be used up by organisms that are able to photosynthesize. Because in the surface ocean, there's a there's an almost limitless supply of carbon dioxide that can kind of exchange from the atmosphere into the ocean. So the production of organic matter in the surface ocean by photosynthesis uses up nutrients and it removes CO2 from the atmosphere and from the surface ocean itself. Now that organic carbon or organic matter that contains carbon and nutrient elements, nitrogen, phosphorus, that makes its way up through the food chain, so it gets eaten by kind of Zooplankton, maybe kind of um, fish, whales, that kind of stuff, big, big guys. Um, and as it moves up to the food chain, uh, the organic matter is packaged together into aggregates. Now, that aggregate formation um, doesn't say on this diagram what that is, but it's basically poop. Um, so it's zooplankton poop or fish poop. And those packets of organic matter, they start to sink. Through the ocean because you start to package them to get to large enough things they become large enough to sink through the water column and um, what that effectively does is that that sinking can overcome this barrier to mixing across the picnic so the sinking of organic matter from the surface can export carbon into the, the the layers of the ocean just below the surface and that organic carbon as it sinks down to the ocean, it gradually gets respired by bacteria. Um, the little aggregates start to break apart. And what that does is that then returns the carbon dioxide back into the aqueous phase, or returns the carbon back into the aqueous phase. So we've now taken CO2 from the surface ocean, and we've basically pumped it down through this packaging into organic kind of fish poop, sinking it down and then respiring it back into the um, into the dissolved phase. So it's the same with nutrients. Any nutrients that get into the surface ocean also get kind of packaged up and sent down into the deeper layers of the ocean. So this is uh, quite an important process in determining also how much carbon can be stored in the ocean because this deep layer in the ocean, these deep layers, it can't interact with the atmosphere because it's sealed off by this surface layer. 
so we can increase the carbon content of the ocean by driving uh, carbon from the surface down into the deep ocean uh, and, um, and increasing the total carbon content that way. That will also lower the pH of the deep ocean because we're constantly adding carbon dioxide to this, this deep water. So this is a case of ocean acidification, not through us uh, putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and that dissolving in the ocean. This is a case of ocean acidification through basically natural processes. So we're acidifying the ocean through biological activity, redistributing effectively acidity from the surface ocean. So this, this process of organic matter formation will actually raise the pH, it will reduce the acidity in the surface ocean, uh, and it will increase the acidity, lower the pH in the deep ocean. So that the effectiveness of this, this system is dependent on how much nutrient availability there is in the surface ocean, how much is burning off the land, how much we get nutrients into this ray, or maybe how much we can have storm mixing between these two layers. Uh, that might introduce some nutrients into the surface layer, which would stimulate primary production of organic matter, which would then pump carbon down into the deep layer. Um, it's also dependent on how effective this packaging is. So the, the health of, of ecosystems and, and the food webs and how effectively organic matter can be recycled um, also has an impact on this uh, biological carbon pumping mechanism. So let's have a look at the impact of that on oxygen. So oxygen is quite intimately involved in, in, the, in this, this carbon pump because whenever you do photosynthesis or respiration, that involves oxygen. And it works basically the opposite way to carbon dioxide. So in the surface ocean, rather than being removing uh, gases, so we, we, we would remove CO2, but we're actually producing oxygen. So in the surface, we have high oxygen, and in the, the deep ocean, we have low oxygen. So if we increase the, the effectiveness of this carbon pump, we can further reduce the oxygen concentration in this, this deep ocean. So in most parts of the ocean, this is not a problem because there's loads of oxygen going there. But if this uh, surface layer becomes stratified enough to really thoroughly isolate the deep ocean for long enough, and we produce loads and loads of organic matter in the surface ocean, so maybe if we, if we warm up the surface ocean a lot more by, by, by global warming, that means that this, this boundary becomes harder to mix uh, across, if we add nutrients from more runoff from the land, that will mean more um, plants in the surface, okay? which would mean more export of organic matter sinking down into the, 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 the intermediate and deep parts of the ocean and more respiration. So oxygen would be removed. And this is happening in, in some places. And we'll have a look at this. So uh, just uh, to summarize uh, from, from so far, um, primary production, so that the formation of organic carbon by photosynthesis removes uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It removes it from the, the surface ocean. That then takes that organic matter and uh, that sinks down and is effectively removing the carbon from the surface layer of the ocean, taking it effectively out of the grasp of the atmosphere. Um, but that can be returned to the ocean through respiration. So um, here's a, basically uh, uh, an example of, of how this is uh, maybe different in different parts of the ocean. So uh, uh, two different ocean basins, We're looking at basically another vertical cross section uh, of the Atlantic on the left and the Pacific on the right. Uh, and what you can see in the Pacific Ocean, that this biological pump uh, combined with the isolation of the deep ocean from the surface layer by basically a more intense uh, picnocline leads to a much more uh, reduced oxygen concentration in the uh, deep ocean, or at least in the intermediate ocean. Um, so these are sometimes called oxygen minimum zones or uh, sometimes referred to as dead zones, because the oxygen concentration has become so low that, that basically um, uh, macrofauna 
So animals can't live in that water. Um, uh, there are additional uh, impacts in this in terms of the chemistry, because there are bacteria that, that live in this water. And bacteria uh, usually, well, not usually, but there are bacteria that respire organic matter using oxygen. So they are kind of very common at the Earth's surface. Uh, but in the absence of oxygen, other bacteria can come along and they can take that organic matter that's carrying on falling through this water and they can use different oxidizing agents uh, that are present in the water other than oxygen to respire that organic matter. And as it turns out, one of those oxidizing agents is nitrate. So they can use nitrate, nutrient that is present in the water, that has actually been released into the water by the decay of other sinking organic matter. Um, uh, now, the issue for the planet, if that happens, is that the products of that um, uh, redox process uh, are gases like nitrous oxide, which are quite powerful greenhouse gases. Um, so this problem of reducing oxygen in, in deep water can have uh, quite, a, I guess, climatic impacts as well as kind of um, ecological impacts in terms of um, this oxygen zone expands, oxygen minimum zone expands, gets more intense, then it can start to introduce oxygen poor water, I think oxygen, low oxygen water, not poor water, which is a different thing. Um, use, introduce oxygen depleted water to the surface where it can have quite dramatic impacts on ecosystems. Um, so uh, just quickly, we can have a look at how this might be changing in the future. So with a, with a warming planet, we might expect that that biological pump to increase in its intensity because we might have more um, biological activity just because it's warmer. Um, uh, we might also uh, might expect that the, the, the layering in the ocean might get more intense as the surface ocean becomes warmer, more buoyant, and therefore it's harder to mix oxygen down into the deeper ocean. But it's not quite that simple uh, with the warmer world. It might get more stormy, which might lead to a little bit more mixing. Um, but some of the work that's been done basically kind of so far with, with, with models does suggest that in the future, with the oxygen concentrations of these intermediate depths in the ocean, so not quite in the, the deep bottom ocean, but basically just below that surface layer, are expected to decline into the future. Uh, and actually that the observations that we've had so far um, do appear to, to show a, a, a greater depletion than we would expect from, from our understanding of, of, of the ocean. So this is this is this is a substantial problem uh, in in the open ocean, but also in kind of the um, coastal regions where we have this additional driver of increased uh, nutrient runoff from basically coastal pollution, increased agriculture, poor regulation, and that kind of thing, and that increased nutrient input in coastal zones. Uh, basically supercharges that, that organic carbon pump, stimulates primary productivity in the surface, and leads to um, uh, basically the water immediately below the surface becoming very depleted in, in, in oxygen. Um, so uh, this is a, a, a basically a map over here on, on the right hand side, just showing uh, the Gulf of Mexico, um, uh, showing that the bloom of productivity coming out of the Mississippi Delta because of the increased agricultural runoff from this region. And this is having a really big impact on the uh, oxygen in this part of the Gulf of Mexico. The, 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 there's a large scale kind of die off of benthic ecosystems in this, in this place because of the, the, the deoxygenation of the water. Um, I put in the corner now this, 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 I guess this is somebody's belly button with some glitter on it. Um, just to put this into some kind of context of the, the I guess, the current, uh, I guess, environmental. Um, uh, movements to kind of like move away from kind of like microplastics in everything that we do. So microplastics are a problem. They're definitely a problem in the ocean. They definitely shouldn't be there. They cause all kinds of damage that we're not really sure about. But in the grand scheme of things, there not being any oxygen in the water is much more, more of a problem than it being full of plastic. Um, because you can't breathe. Well, you can't breathe underwater at all because you're a mammal. Um, but fish cannot breathe uh, water that doesn't have the oxygen in it. 
irrespective of its glitter content. Okay, so we'll stop there, and the next video will start to look at some of the changes we're seeing. Sorry that was so long. Um, again, stop it, make some notes. Do some stuff.